So um, like Derek said, I'm a customer success engineer with Sonatype. Um, I also have history as a developer consultant with Red Hat. I um, used to do development work and kind of just went on projects and did whatever customers needed me to do. So today I'm going to talk to you about how to prevent developers from coming at you with Valyrian Steel. So what, what does this mean exactly? So I'm going to outline how you as a policy team can strategically enforce IQ server across your software development lifecycle. And the main goal of this being reducing or without reducing developer productivity. So develop, development productivity should be a central drive for you as a policy team. And developers are essentially the ones creating the software and are somewhat of a backbone to the company. But you kind of, you as a policy team help mold and shape what they do and help guide them in the right direction. So I've had many customers go through this recently and I wanted to use this opportunity to discuss this journey and um, so introducing security and legal enforcement can be a rocky road, but it doesn't have to be. And so I'll be reviewing a couple important points to sort out before considering enforcement. So the normal journey of a customer typically looks like this. First, there's a phase of discovery, which includes onboarding applications into the IQ server and taking inventory of, of all of your applications and what vulnerabilities exist. And what the overall threat looks like to the company. Then the policy team typically creates policy that fits your company's standards. Um, typically, customers will have a policy workshop that lets us educate um, their team on how to configure that policy. And then typically, several months pass and, and customers are ready to start testing the waters. Sometimes months pass, pass with no progress at all and, and due to other priorities, which is completely normal. Um, and at this point, when they say they're ready to start cracking down on these policy enforcement, at this point, they kind of, and you kind of have to think um, on that you have an idea of how the policies will come into play, and you've had months to digest this, but this moves into the actual enforcement and mitigation, and things start to get rocky. So enforcement tends to be the most difficult and important part of adoption. And what exactly do I mean by enforcement? Enforcement means utilizing the Nexus platform to either warn or fail on builds, preventing apps from being promoted to production, or preventing developers from bringing in vulnerable components with firewall. So at first glance, this kind of seems like a simple task, like, oh, I can just flip a switch and this will start working. But in reality, there's so much more to it. Sometimes, Enforcement may not always be the best option as well. So maybe ask yourself, why do I need to fail builds? And, and also, what precautions have I taken up front? Maybe development teams need time to digest, and for now, maybe only enforce on new violations or ensure that apps are integrated wherever possible, so Jenkins or the IDE. And this may also be a point where you need to make an internal checklist of what should be in place before you start failing on those builds or start having an impact on the development pipeline. So if you're the policy team, how do you prevent developers from coming at you with the Valyrian Steel when you want to start enforcing this policy? If you want to begin enforcement, how do you make adoption easier for developers and enforcement a less rocky road? So it's always good to put yourselves in their shoes and say, what would I need from security or legal that will make this a smooth transition and won't hinder my current development process? What learning materials do I need? Where can I go for information and who can I talk to? So within my time at Sonatype as a CSE, I've experienced a ton of customer journeys that have been shaken up or even halted due to enforcement. So here's a few common examples. The company will sometimes have a mandate to crack down on security and security says, well, I'll just turn these policies to fail and they'll have to fix it. In this example, some of the customers are banks or finance or you know, they've run into a legal issue. For example, iText where iText has changed their license and now say, you owe me money. Or they've already ex experienced a security breach 
and they need to immediately jump on the issue and get some kind of results quickly. Mandates tend to somewhat be common for customers, uh, but, it, but jumping aggressively into policy enforcement can lead to a nightmare. Another example is when policy teams suddenly decide that they need to fail builds immediately or turn on quarantine or firewall so that they can stop bad stuff from happening or entering in the first place. This can potentially create a massive disruption in development and can hinder different business units from leasing, especially without some kind of communication. A lot of the time you'll find that people have, will have turned on policy or enforcement for a policy and then received some kind of immediate backlash from development because they've given essentially no warning. They then have to turn it off which immediately causes them to lose some credibility and follow through for future plans to enforce. A final story involves viewing an app report and security becoming aggressive and saying they need to fix these or they can't blah, blah, blah. This is something I commonly hear during a policy workshop and people wanting to get results as fast as they, as they can, but time and research is needed for most of these fixes. If you're trying to force these things, developers will find a way around it. They're smart people and will do anything that they <laughs> to make their lives easier. We'd like to believe as that everything is as simple as upgrading to a new version, but ultimately most issues aren't that way. So I've also seen many customers who start cracking down on policy enforcement and start with a team that's a bit resilient to change and who have the messiest applications. This led to a major pushback from developers and scared other teams away from the product and the change. So by being overly aggressive with policy enfor enforcement and threatening developers to remediate immediately, this created a horrible experience. Some customers have also showed showcased bad applications, which can create a negative atmosphere rather than welcoming a gradual change and offering help. In my own personal experience as a developer, I've found that negative reinforcement creates a super hostile atmosphere. And rather than creating an opportunity for developers to have a space, a safe space to learn and figuring out how a security co uh, coding program works. So a final horror story looks like this. Immediately after a policy term learns about policy and how they can configure policy, they'll say, hey, let's just set everything to fail or warn just to be safe and make sure nothing slips through the cracks. So why is this bad? This is too aggressive with policy and warns and fails can hinder develop developer productivity very quickly. With this amount of noise and blockage, developers will ignore and like I said before, they'll find workarounds to avoid unnecessary noise. This ultimately leads to a wildfire situation where people start pulling components from random places, alter their builds to get out of these policy restrictions, and this eventually leads to even more vulnerabilities or issues than we started with in the first place. So hold the deal. Why can't you do this? What are the implications? Why can't I just turn this on and tell everyone it's gonna happen? They have to listen to me anyway. How can I enter into this phase of enforcement without stunting the progress of development teams? So every big ch change comes with a plan in place. Enforcement strategy is the first major checkpoint in a successful use case of enforcement with the Nexus platform. If you don't have a plan of how developers are going, how do you, developers going to know what they're going to do? So I'm gonna give you some key strategies that have always proven successful for various customer deployments. This is essentially like saying, we're gonna make sure every Game of Thrones episode is as good as the first five seasons. Okay, well, how do you do that? So the first key step to developing a strategy is mitigating risk and testing the waters to figure out how the different roles in the company essentially wanna understand that risk and this will eventually lead to an enforcement strategy. So for risk tolerance, what risk tolerance does security have? What risk tolerance do developers have? What do I let in and what do I let out? So essentially you need to come to an internal uh, agreement on, on what, how people view this risk. 
If everyone agrees on a strategy, everyone will be on the same team. And with that alliance, you'll send a solid message moving forward. If you can't agree on this, what needs to happen first to get to that point? You may need to start with a smaller goal that is a, that e that's easily achievable and take smaller chewable bites. You also need to mitigate the risks of enforcing on these policies. So what would be the repercussions of turning everything to fail? What if I were a developer and couldn't go to production all of a sudden? What do I, what do, I do and, and how, who do I go to? It's important to figure out these risks and iron them out before stepping into enforcement. And also, be sure to test your plan and try this out with the POC team to see how things will play out. So, if possible, start with a team that will set a good example for the rest of the company or groups that you're trying to onboard. Don't start with someone or a team that's like Joffrey who may not listen to anything and may try to shoot you with a crossbow. It's important that adoption is a positive experience for those involved and, and essentially they'll become advocates for a secure coding practice. This makes your job easier and a happy developer makes a happy policy team. Don't shame them, don't shame a team that's already struggling too. This can lead to a bad situation and sets a bad reputation for the product and yourself. So while starting to gain visibility with the messiest and dirtiest applications can be a good thing, enforcement may not be the best option. It is good to encourage them to remediate and work on issues, but you can't expect them to weed out 10 vulnerabilities in a day. So it's important also to take policy one by one in a large deployment, or two at a time if you have a less number of apps. By starting small, you're setting a precedent and you're also setting expectations for future enforcement and the future policies that you essentially uh, crank up as you go. So once you get a feel for how things will play out with those one or two policies, you'll be able to iterate on the process, gain faster feedback, and know what does and doesn't work. Smaller is more manageable, and by starting with policy, I also suggest starting small with what findings appear in the application report. Grandfathering is a relatively new feature in lifecycle, and by utilizing grandfathering, you can create a shorter list of vulnerabilities for developers to tackle. The grandfathering feature in Nexus IQ creates a baseline of existing policy violations and basically says, okay, I need time to fix these, but any, anything new that comes up will follow these policy rules. By not utilizing grandfathering and not communicating and educating developers on these findings, this could be like saying, I have 12 loads of laundry and you better clean these all by tomorrow. How would you feel with a long list of issues and no direction? Which colors do I start with? Where do I start? How, do I even have enough hours in the day to do one load of laundry? So by utilizing grandfathering, it's less daunting and have more actionable findings. This shows them that you have a set of things you need to get them, you need them to get out. These are what matter to your company. Rather than 12 loads of laundry, there's one or two and you're saying do the red load first. So before diving into something as complex as enforcement, it's important to have some form of plan going into the enforcement phase. Maybe it's too big of an undertaking in the meantime. This may, be something, this may mean starting with something smaller first and then working your way up toward enforcement and having a more controlled pipeline. By mitigating risk, starting small, and coming up with a strategy for a manageable load and a team that will be willing to work with you and not against you, you'll set yourself up for a successful plan. So the second most important key to preventing developers from coming at you with Valyrian Steel is developer education and communication. So the more developers know, the more they're empowered to make better choices. The more communication that happens, the better the culture and people are actually willing to work with you. So here are some important things that you can do to make this successful. So there's some things that you need to ask yourself currently. So how are you currently sending notifications out? How are you communicating with your teams? Um, are you using Slack or Confluence? Also, when there's a new vulnerability that comes out, how do you communicate this to your developers? By over communicating with them, 
you are being clear with your expectations and are giving them more than enough information on how to fix the issues and also how this new process and culture change is going to work. Also, warn developers before enforcing or turning a policy to fail for a certain stage. I can't tell you the number of times that I've heard uh, policy teams say, I'm just going to turn this on and I'm not going to tell them. If you give them a set amount of time and after that you follow through, they're going to understand that there's a process and that they need to adhere to those rules. So not only does this help you with making developers aware of changes um, that are upcoming, but it also helps for feedback loops. There are feedback loops for setting the process standards and feedback from developers on policy changes. So for example, if you introduce a security critical um, policy, but security high is too much to manage, you can get this information up front. And this feedback for you as a policy team may be terrifying, but if you let them know that you're listening and you care, they will care as well. So another, another important point for communication and education are one-on-one -on -one with development teams. So what do these one-on-ones look like? They can be anywhere from lunch and learns. Um, so lunch and learns are, are one of the most successful methods that I've seen from customers. And it gives a chance for developers to kind of see what this is gonna look like. And it gives a kind of more casual environment for them to, for you to demo the product, um, to show an example of how they would onboard into the IQ server, um, where they would go for training materials, who to talk to, and then also just helps you connect names with faces and gives them a person to talk to when they run into issues. So also another option would be to give them an opportunity to share the report with you in a one-on-one -on -one session and ask about findings and how to deal with those findings. It gives you a chance to walk through a triage documentation, show them where to get started with remediation and what to look for. And then finally, give them a starting point whether, like I said, it's using, utilizing grandfathering or give them actionable set of findings. Uh, just give them a starting point and say, we're starting with tens and eventually we'll focus on these other violations. So essentially by providing developers with, with an integration points, um, especially the IDE, they can have these findings up front and can have a chance to take inventory of what's in their application see new vulnerabilities that may come up, and also be proactive in choosing components that follow policy. Give them some kind of internal wiki as well, um, or guide so that they can set this up on their own and have the information they need to get started. By, use, by utilizing the IDE integration and helping them get set up, they can slowly get used to taking this vulnerability inf information into consideration during early development. So another critical step to develop a secure application is effective training plan that allows developers to learn important secure coding principles and how they can be applied. So do you currently have a secure coding program? So all of my most successful customers tend to have some form of secure coding program. It doesn't have to be that involved, but they, they help developers learn how to develop securely. And it gives them a safe space for them to learn at their own pace and allows you to train them so that they can train others and help federate your task of cracking down on secure coding. So if you do have one or you're looking to start a program, we have training material and guides through our site, site my.zonotype.com to get them started and provide a self-service training ground for them. Essentially, developers and security want the same goal to create quality software. So it's up to you to install these best practices for security into their current methods and be a guide for them. It's important to start forming this and making this a self-service option so that there's no bottleneck for developers to learn more information on secure coding. Also, by advocating certifications, developers are also who are certified can teach best practices and others to others and help set the precedent to follow. Finally, utilize the community to provide an open space for developers or you to reach out to advice for other customers um, or with just the general community to find out what practices work and don't work. 
this is a relatively new um, space that we've added and it's it's really an amazing space for the policy team and developers to kind of reach out and learn more about our training material and then also just talk with other customers to figure out what they're doing. So take this opportunity when you're considering enforcement with the Nexus platform and ask yourself, how am I gonna utilize this tool to create an opportunity to educate developers and, and potentially change the culture into a secure coding culture? And you may even ask, is my company ready for this yet? If not, there are smaller steps you can take and smaller wins that you can make before getting to that point. Whether it's turning on firewall for security critical vulnerabilities, setting up continuous monitoring on maybe your business critical applications or just getting integrated at all points within the software development life cycle for visibility like Jenkins or the IDE, those are already small wins that are getting you closer to that point. So rather than setting an environment where developers can never win, if you take a less aggressive approach to enforcement and execute with a strategy, you'll create a safe training environment for developers. This way you won't end up with a wall of shame or discredit yourself by having to turn enforcement on and off constantly, and you're setting developers up for success. If developers have the knowledge and are empowered to make better choices, you can have quality conversations around fixes and best practices with them. By sticking with your plan and over communicating developers and giving them the materials they need, this is gonna be a much smoother journey for everyone. So it's important to follow these principles or the ending will look just as bad for you as it did for Game of Thrones. And that's it.